everyone, Alexa Dunn here, and today I am going to be doing a reading wrap-up, slightly different this time around, because all I'm going to be talking about is nine works of non-fiction that I read over the last, like, six weeks. There were a couple of books in there that were fiction, but because the vast majority are non-fiction, I'm in a mood. I'm just gonna move those fiction titles to my next reading wrap-up once I've started reading fiction again. I have the TBR, but I keep going from non-fiction and non-fiction, a mix of memoirs, true crime, but they're all kind of along the same lines of like people died or personality disorders, and it all kind of falls under that umbrella. And my disclaimer up front, some of these that I read are very dark, and so they might not be for you. Though that said, if you like a lot of the thrillers that I normally read, a lot of these nonfiction picks are going to be really great complimentary reads. I read them because I was interested in each of the different things, but as I read them I was like, oh, this this can come in handy for fiction, which is what I do a lot when I read nonfiction. So without further ado, let's jump in. Uh, you're going to notice a pattern. Several of these were inspired by things I watched. And the first one was I made a Mommy Dearest joke in my manuscript and I was talking with someone about it. I was like, I want to watch Mommy Dearest. So I pulled it up and I watched Mommy Dearest again. It's this ridiculous camp movie from 1980 about Joan Crawford being a horrible, abusive mother. I've seen it many, many times because it's a camp cult classic that was on cable all the time when I was growing up. There are lines that I can recite from this movie. It is super cheesy. If you haven't watched it and you want to watch kind of a ridiculous movie. I do actually recommend it from that point of view. And I was on the IMDb trivia and I saw a trivia fact that the woman who played Carol Ann, who was the personal assistant slash kind of like maid to Joan in the movie, that the actress wrote a memoir about filming the movie. And this movie is notorious for being a huge bomb. Like it did really, really poorly. It got all these Razzies, but it had started out as this wannabe Oscar contender. And I also knew that it was based on the memoir Mommy Dearest by Christina Cross. Crawford, Joan Crawford's real life adopted daughter. But I'd never read Mommy Dearest. With all that said, I went to Kindle and aha, the memoir, The Mommy Dearest Diaries by Rutania Alda was on Kindle Unlimited, and so I read it. It was a pretty good read. I think I ended up giving it 3.5 stars for reasons which I will get to, but like overall, as I say all the time, it did what it said on the tin. Uh, Ritania Alda was kind of a character actress, kind of, in like the 70s, and then her most known role essentially is this movie because it's a camp cult classic, and she gives you kind of backstory, background in the first half about her life and kind of how she ended up being cast and what led her to being in this movie, and then the second half, the rest of the book, is allegedly, I have feelings about this, her literal diary from when she was working on the movie. She apparently wrote in her journal every single day, more or less, while they were filming. And so you get that in the moment of kind of the turmoil of what it took to film this movie. Apparently Faye Dunaway was a nightmare, like that's been kind of a known thing for decades now. And you kind of get a sense of how something started off as this prestige project that had Oscar potential and turned into a complete hot mess. It was definitely engaging and entertaining. Uh, probably the biggest thing for me, I struggled at first, slightly in the transition between the first half, uh, which is about her life, and I definitely found her life and kind of her body of work interesting, though I hadn't really heard of most of the stuff that she was in. Most of her movies have been kind of lost to history. This is kind of the biggest one other than The Deer Hunter. She was in The Deer Hunter, which is pretty famous. Um, into the journal style, where this is what I found odd about it. The journal was in First person, present tense, essentially first person because it's her journal, but present tense, which I guess I found really odd. I never journaled in present tense. I guess it's just like a style thing. Like when I kept a journal, it was like, today I did this, this happened. But with hers, it's present tense in the sense of like, you know that she would have written it toward the end of the day, right? She would have written things after they'd happen, and yet it's written like, I go to the studio and sit in my chair and Faye walks by and I have, that's where I have this like, this like little diggling in my head of like, is this really your journal verbatim? She swears up and down other than some editing for clarity and in a couple places protecting someone's identity. Though for the most part she spills the tea because almost everyone involved is 
dead. So you actually get all the tea, so to speak, but it just doesn't mean anything because you won't have, know who most of the people are. Uh, I just had this feeling of like, is this really legitimately exactly what you wrote? I have some questions about that. I also wonder if she wrote the entire thing. She's either an incredibly gifted narrative writer or she worked with a ghostwriter because the narrative section, so there's a little bit after the diary ends, like a little bookend at the end, and then the first half are above average in terms of writing quality. I really like was sucked in and enjoyed it. And then the journal is good. It's still well written, but it's not quite on the level of the rest. So I did wonder about that. But once you get used to the fact that the diary is in first person present tense and you kind of throw away that niggling of, is this exactly as you wrote it? Cause I just find it very strange regardless. Good read, you got all the, the tea, so to speak. So the reason I ended up, I think I gave it a 3.5 and I, I rounded it up. My one little thing, I put it in my Goodreads review, which I will link to down below. It's just this, again, it was a niggling thing that kind of, I just, I couldn't give this five stars even though it was a perfectly good read. There's a thing in memoirs where someone writes about themselves where it, it's a fine line to walk, to be perfectly frank, because where is the line between kind of telling a story that people want to hear and self-aggrandizing narcissism? Well, some stories tip into self-aggrandizing narcissism, and I caught little bits of that in this book where I started to strongly suspect I shouldn't armchair diagnose anyone, so all I will say is that there are little bits where she's a little bit narcissistic in a way that was off-putting as a reader. And maybe it's actually that she's self-conscious that you won't have heard of most of the movies that she did, as I hadn't heard of most of the movies that she did, but she goes out of her way in a weird way to be like, I received rave reviews for this role. I was called out in the New York Times review or the Variety review as being a standout. You know, this did really well. I got a nomination for this. And then this, the weirdest part though was, there was, there's that and then there's a weird section and throughout the book where she reminds you over and over again that she was really, really hot when she was younger. She was really beautiful. And you do get in her history, all the famous people that she slept with. She tells you about that. She apparently had a prolonged affair with Robert Altman. Very interesting. But she talks about how hot she was and there's, and how Faye Dunaway hated that and how she ha had to make herself ugly on the set. And th there's this moment where she dressed in this white suit and had some headshots taken on set and she looked sexy as F and she like says this thing where some guy walks by and it's clear that he wanted to have sex with her. And I just had this moment of like, calm down, hon, calm down, where it felt, that's where it felt a little like weirdly narcissistic. It was just really kind of off-putting and sort of weird. And also just a note, if you decide to read this, first of all, only read it if you've seen the movie and you know the movie and you just really want this tea. I would read the book first, then watch the movie. If you've seen the movie, uh, personally, so that you can kind of have things in your head and then watch the movie. I watched the movie first. Oh, well, her marriage was really rocky during the filming of this movie. And so her journal goes also in depth into her personal problems and her marriage problems. And that's not going to be for everyone. It's not all Faye Dunaway was a nightmare 24 seven. So just kind of bear that in mind. It's just as much personal memoir about her own personal stuff as anything else. It is interesting. Her husband was basically a drug addict. It's, it's, uh, anyway, it gave me a taste though, where I was like, huh, Mommy Dearest by Christina Crawford was also on Kindle Unlimited. And that became my next read and five stars. I devoured it, but like slowly because it's a dense, meaty book. I don't know exactly how many pages, but like in terms of Kindle, it took me almost a week to read it, but I was reading it every night for a few hours a night because I wanted to read it. It was well written. It was totally engrossing. And it is one of the best portraits of a narcissistic parent and narcissistic parental abuse that I have ever read. And it's a topic that really fascinates me. And the thing is, it was kind of the first. So for your context, Mommy Dearest is very, very famous. I've always known about this book because of the movie, mind you, because it came out in like 1977, 1978. First of all, first time someone had basically outed a Hollywood starlet, they were still pretty bulletproof at the time as being a real person, a messy person, a flat out abusive parent. And it caused 
huge shock waves, huge ripples. Joan had just died, and also Christine was cut out of the well, which is part of the book. It's part of the movie too. But even bigger than that, this is a time in the 70s where a lot of things about kind of psychology and therapy and all sorts of ideas about pathology and abuse were, you know, being spoken about openly in ways that they weren't before. And so Mommy Dearest became kind of a landmark book for abuse victims. It's it's something that made a lot of people feel seen, that helped a lot of people articulate things. And what's so fascinating about reading it is, as we understand narcissistic parents and abuse and personalities now, like it's all there, as I said, and there's a new introduction to, I think what I read was the 40th anniversary version uh, on ebook, and Christina Crawford says, like, now we have the, this language and these terms and these ways to kind of describe and understand these things, but at the time we didn't have any of that. And it's so true because you read it and she's describing it. And I cannot imagine what it was like to read this book when it first came out because now we have tools that we just didn't have then. I loved it. Uh, Christina Crawford's a very good writer and she gets a lot of criticism that I find really fascinating. I did a little bit of digging. So for context, Joan Crawford was a Hollywood starlet. She adopted four kids. Christina was the first uh, child she adopted. I think it was 1939. And then she also adopted a son, Christopher. And for the first nine, 10 years of Christina's life, it was just her and Christopher. And Christina had this horrifically abusive childhood. And if you see the movie Mommy Dearest, this is the most fascinating thing for me comparing the two. A ton of the worst things from Mommy Dearest, the movie of course comes straight out of her memoir. Like it's very accurate. However, there's so much stuff that they left out uh, and it's interesting the things they chose to focus on in the movie and I was definitely reading with kind of bearing that in mind. Some of the worst aspects of the abuse um, happened when she was older and the, the movie focuses on the physical abuse when she was living at home and of course emotional abuse but then she goes to boarding school and it actually got worse and the movie kind of glosses over it as Christina hooked up with a boy and her mom sent her to Catholic boarding school but it was way more intense than that and then it continued when she went off to Carnegie Mellon to college it continued through her adulthood she didn't go no contact until she was in like her late 20s uh, which is a whole other thing um, and then they actually reconciled. It gets very, very dramatic. Uh, point is, I loved it. <laughs> and if any of this sounds good to you, I highly recommend it. Uh, with the people of the naysayers, she has two younger adopted siblings who were adopted when she'd already been sent to boarding school, basically. So they never grew up in the same house. And of course, those younger siblings never saw what happened to Christina. If, and if you're familiar with narcissistic family structures, you have golden children, you have scapegoats, etc. It's really clear that her younger adopted siblings were the golden children and Christina was the scapegoat. And so it's fascinating that to this day, Christina's like, this is what happened to me. And like, it, it's very clear it happened. Her brother backed her up too, but her younger adopted siblings say that she's a liar. And it's very fascinating. People will say, this is because she didn't get the money. When you read the book, yes, she was upset by the inheritance, the being cut out of the will. And yes, she contested it, but I mean, it wasn't just about money. I mean, one of the most fascinating things about it for me is the way that Joan purposefully over years and years, very subtly sabotaged any attempt Christina made to make a living, to be an actress, to actually support herself. It just, oh, the emotional manipulation was really amazing. Uh, I'm blathering on. I loved this book. Five stars. If you are interested in this at all, if you've seen the movie, if you're fascinated by old Hollywood or by narcissism, pathological stuff, read this book. And so I was jonesing for something similar to this. I was on Kindle Unlimited. Uh, I wanted something memoir -y as well, maybe also about a tough childhood. And I decided to give a chance to a book also on Kindle Unlimited that was self-published. Actually, a lot of these are self-published. Um, and it's an interesting mixed bag. And I only mention it because in the case of this next book, it actually mattered. So I read The Unbreakable Child by Kim Michelle Richardson. So the warning I want to give ahead of time. Well, first, the reason I decided to read it, I read the sample pages and the writing was good. I was like, oh, this is well written. Uh, it's about a girl who she and her siblings were raised in an abusive Catholic orphanage. And then later they sued the diocese for the abuse of their childhood. So I knew the framework of the context going in. 
But I'll say to any readers, like, don't read this if you're triggered by childhood abuse. That could also be a problem with Mommy Dearest, though. Mommy Dearest, I didn't find it gratuitous, and it is balanced with the whole of Christina's life and her story, and she clearly has a lot of emotional distance in a way like and it's written in that way that it wasn't it wasn't gratuitous that is not the case with this book and that is my biggest criticism of it the author very clearly is still traumatized understandably by the way uh by this horrific childhood uh but what it it ends up being because she did she clearly didn't have an editor there was no one to rein her in to guide her or even a ghostwriter it's basically a chronological blow by blow over the course of say four years of just really horrific abuse and it started to feel gratuitous to me. I was like, wow, I don't know how much more of this I can read. This is horrific. Asterisk, but also at the same time, because the author is a writer, a, she writes fiction, have these moments throughout the text where it felt too specific at times. It felt too detailed uh, and the kind of narrative framing felt off. So what I mean is she writes it from the point of view of her child self in first person, not in third person. You are in the perspective of child Kim, starting when she's five, going until she's like 10. But there's almost no difference emotionally uh, in the writing between five-year-old Kim and 10-year-old Kim but I'd say it's written like a seven or eight year old. So meaning you're, you're reading in the five year old perspective and it feels too old. And then you're reading in the 10 year old perspective and it feels way too young. 10 year old Kim is uh, thinking things and responding to things. And you're like, you don't seem like a 10 year old, which could be because of the trauma, but more likely it's the author is trying a little too hard to be like, I have to be back in the head of my child self and make them believe they're reading from the perspective of a child. And it actually at some point just became too much and it led to that feeling of gratuity of being in the abuse and it beggared belief at points, honestly. It was also just a little bit repetitive. That said, it's not all deep flashback. It is intercut with her as an adult going to the lawyer, being part of the lawsuit, depositions with the church. And that was actually the weakest part of the book for me, where I just felt it really needed an editor, a professional to shape this into a cohesive narrative memoir. That is where it was actually most clear that the author was just too close to everything. Again, understandably, it's trauma. But as a reader, I just felt like I didn't have enough context. I didn't understand what was going on half the time. So it, they would tell you that the lawyer for the diocese was being really horrible and interrogating her and it would have those lines to elicit your sympathy. But then her response would be not much and you get nothing kind of it from her internal thought process. So there was, she was telling you what happened and you would get nothing back in terms of processing or context, which is What's the point? You're just walking me through things that happened, but I'm not have really understanding anything. You also get nothing from anyone else ever other than some conversations with her lawyer and recountings of these depositions. You never hear from her sister who also suffered the abuse. You never hear from her family. I, you don't know a lot about her family other than that she really loves her husband. You get a ton of that. But this thing directly impacted her family because she sent her kids to Catholic school. You basically never get any narrative context of how she ended up as a functional adult with a family. You don't get a sense of her family. It's basically lacking any real narrative and even nonfiction needs narrative so that readers can have context and there's kind of an arc. There were also 40 other people involved in the case and in an ideal work of nonfiction, I would want to hear from other people. I would want essentially more journalistic context. It's just not what this book is. And that's okay, but I just honestly don't recommend it unless your wheelhouse is raw memoir that really goes into stories of abuse. I personally don't like that. I did read the whole thing, but I don't read a book about something horrible that happens to someone just to read a play-by-play -play of the horrible things that happened. I'm more interested in 
arc, context, explanation, hopefully growth or processing. That's usually why people go to read these sorts of pieces of nonfiction. So this one just really didn't work for me. Well, luckily, next, I read a total home run. I read If You Tell by Greg Olson. Now, another content warning for you. This one also intensely gets into horrific abuse, but in the context of an expertly written narrative nonfiction arc, I actually went into it pretty cold, other than basically what the cover copy tells you. It's three grown women who are sisters and grew up in an abusive home and something horrific happened in their childhood and they didn't tell anyone until they were adults. And, and I, so I knew that obviously they had abusive parents. That's all that I knew. And in fact, when I started reading it, I was a bit confused as to why it was opening in the 1950s with this uh, woman marrying this man and he had children from a previous marriage. And I was like, huh. So the book is really about a woman named Shelley Notek. And I did kind of cheat a little because I just, oh, I did a little bit of Googling and I got a slight sense of what lay ahead though. As soon as I saw some of the headlines, I was like, oh no, I don't want to spoil myself too hard. And I'm glad so if you also don't want to spoil yourself, you can skip ahead and just read the book. Well, I'll give you the short non spoilery ish version. It's definitely about three sisters, half sisters growing up in this horrific environment and more or less how they escaped. But it's also about the depths of depravity of their mother, Shelley Notek. And that's why it starts in the 50s. The author did extensive interviews with her stepmother to get a view of Shelley's childhood to try to better understand what lay ahead. And then the rest of the narrative is the what lay ahead. And it just spiraled and spiraled and spiraled. And then it got to a place and I was like, wait, no. Oh no. And then it kept going and it got worse and then it got worse again. I was riveted. And so Greg Olson is actually a popular thriller writer. He writes adult thrillers mostly for Amazon imprints and this is an Amazon book. Smartest thing they ever did was ask him to write this book on behalf of the sisters. They are telling their story. It was, it reads like fiction, but it's all real. And it is one of the best portraits, deepest portraits I have ever read specifically of a female psychopath. If you are also fascinated by that, read this book. I'm not going to tell you anything other than that because that's essentially all I knew go going in because I read about the childhood part and they were describing things and I was like, wait, and then yes. Um, five, uh, I, it struck me speechless. I'm sure I could say more, but really all I have to say is read it. With the slight warning, as I kind of said at the beginning, it does get graphic at certain points about some pretty horrific things. If that is not your speed, the book's not going to work for you. The descriptions of abuse aren't as gratuitous as say the previous book I read, but they're vivid enough because Greg Olson is such a talented writer. And it's also pretty psychologically disturbing. Like it, it's, there are multiple people in the book, figures in the book who just, some of them do horrific things by not doing anything as well. It's just, it's pretty bad. But I, I, the book was incredible. I absolutely loved it. Five stars. It's uh, between that and Mommy Dearest. I mean, I had a bang up August. And so I wanted to continue the high. It's the adrenaline rush of all. Oh, this book just scratched every itch. And so I next read My Daddy is a Hero by Lena Durhali. So this is about the Chris Watts case. And timing wise, you might be going, oh, I just watched American Murder on Netflix. Or if you haven't watched American Murder on Netflix, watch American Murder on Netflix. I actually went into this book very cold on the Chris Watts case. I, as much as I like true crime, I go into it in waves. And when that was a huge public case, I didn't dig into it that much. Well, I just dug into it now. I basically decided, well, I want to read a book on this. And there were two. So this one, My Daddy is a Hero, is on Kindle Unlimited. So yes, I was inclined towards that one. So was the last one, by the way. Most of these were Kindle Unlimited reads. I was inclined toward it because 
because I love free 99. Well, free 99, I pay for Kindle Unlimited, but this one does appear to be self-published. The other one by a big five press. And I looked at kind of, I read the first pages of both, the first few pages of both, and I did slightly prefer the writing style from the big five one, but something about it itched at me. The first pages of Lena Darhali's book were from the perspective of Shanann, the victim. I could feel how she was just being humanized. And the other one was from the perspective of Chris Watts. It was starting with his childhood and it was clearly trying to build him up as like the all-American boy. And I read some of the reviews of that one on Amazon and I'm glad I did. It made it very clear that the journalist approached the entire Chris Watts story from the case of how could this good old boy go wrong? And I just decided I wasn't about that life. I decided to read not only the free 99 one, which was a bonus, but the one that I knew was gonna basically advocate more for the victims because it's a horrific case. And you know, I do want to know more about Chris Watts and his psychology, but I don't want to hear excuses about how, well, she was a nag of a wife. None of that. And I'm pleased to report. So the book Leonard to Holly is a psychologist or a clinical therapist, something like that. She has some professional credentials, but she's also very careful to disclaim. Well, yes, she's writing this book and analyzing the case from that perspective because she thinks people are interested in it. Yes, we are. There are professional reasons why you're not supposed to armchair diagnose people, but there's also a responsibility to warn and meaning she's very circumspect and thoughtful about the whole thing, which I appreciate. So the first half of the book is walking you through the case. And because I hadn't been into the case before, this was very well needed for me. I needed that play by play, blow by blow. If you are already a junkie for this case, it might be a little bit less useful for you, but I found it very, very helpful to understand exactly who these two people are and kind of laying out what happened. I did do some YouTube spoilers in the middle there because you know when you're like you're reading you're like oh I want to look that up and I was also glad I did that by the way. I will link down below to a couple of videos I did watch that helped uh, kind of flesh out my understanding of the case and then the back half of the book is what makes it special. She analyzes Chris Watts from a, a personality disorder perspective. A lot of people are like, oh, he's such a sociopath. And fascinatingly, no, he's not quite. And I agreed, I was reading, I was like, he just doesn't meet any of the profiles that we're familiar with. And yet, how do you horrifically murder your wife and children out of nowhere? That's not normal. And it's, it, it doesn't, it wasn't a psychotic break. It didn't perform or act like a psychotic break. And so she, you get a really good analysis from her about a type of narcissism that's just not talked about very often. And it was such a fascinating read. I'm suddenly blanking on the type of narcissism it was, but it was really, really interesting. And it was a type that honestly really clicked for me. I was like, I definitely know people like that. So it, the analysis is good. I really enjoyed the book. I can't remember if I gave it four or five stars, but the point is if you're interested in the Chris Watts case and if you watched American Murder on Netflix or plan on watching it, I highly recommend this book. I found that it really informed my viewing experience of American Murder. I liked that I could then watch some of the clips that were referenced in the book, but I was able to watch them and focus on body language and expression having read the book. But the book gave me so much more context about the backstory of their courtship, about their family dynamics, things that you just can't fit into that documentary style. It didn't have any talking heads, etc. So I do recommend My Dad is a Hero as a companion piece to that documentary on Netflix if you plan on watching it slash if you're fascinated by this case. I definitely enjoyed it. And so, yeah, I was looking for another read like, so I read The Girls Are Gone by Michael Broadcorb and Allison Mann. This one was really, really interesting. So it was a case I knew nothing about. I kind of enjoy going into these kind of cold. I just read the blurb and if it sounds interesting enough, I read it. It makes it a little more exciting. And indeed in the first like 20 pages, I was like, what is this book about? Because I, it started out, I was like, okay, two girls disappeared. Okay. I thought it was that kind of book. Not quite. But it, within 20 pages, you're like, wait, this husband comes home well, his wife has told him they're going to do a divorce on paper for financial reasons, but then he comes home and she calls the cops on him because they're divorced and then he steals his money and his house and his kids. It's a lot. It is basically one of the most contentious divorces you will, will have ever heard of. I mean, that and Betty Broderick, right? Um, and, and it is basically, 
This actually gets into, it's the pros and cons. My main criticism of the book is also its strength. Go figure. What this book really is, because the Michael Broadcorp is a journalist, he was a political journalist specifically, who covered a lot of this case in the local newspaper in Minnesota. And the co-writer, Allison Mann, is a lawyer who worked on the legal team for the husband. So already you know that there's bias here, though, I mean, his wife is also probably a sociopath, like deaf, there, something's wrong there. And so thus, there's some bonker stuff that goes on. But the strength is, he's a journalist, very fact-based, very reporting, and she's a lawyer. So you get a chronological play-by-play, blow-by-blow of multiple trials and legal proceedings. It is at its heart an in-depth legal look at this messy divorce and custody case. And the escalations, just the court transcripts, like just to give you like a sneak peek. So the ex-wife had like this bonkers lawyer who also had run for like political office, who was just very unprepared. And like the interactions between her and the judge are bonkers, just like the things that come out of her mouth. And then the ex-wife represents herself at some point, And that's this whole like legal circus. And then the girls disappear, basically two, they have five children and two of the children, first of all, they all turn on their father. And so there's this stuff with parental alienation in the courts. And then two of the girls disappear after he gets custody. And they are missing for years and years and years and the father's looking for them. It's this whole bonkers case. So if you're interested in that, if you're interested in the divorce, the custody, family court, um, the conflict of personalities of, I mean, I am, I definitely am on the side of the rational, thoughtful humans who cared about the well-being of children and not on the side of, it's basically a circus of people with personality disorders, like for sure. It's a bunch of people who conspired to commit a crime, basically. Um, it, it's fascinating, but what it does lack, so like its strength is its weakness. Um, what it does lack, this is, I like legal stuff. I'm interested in legalese and court proceedings and that kind of stuff. But this book really lacks a proper narrative arc in a way as it relates to the main story, <laughs> the missing girls, the daughters who go missing, the kids, the family, the, the family being torn apart, the parental alienation. So you're going to read this slow play by play with a ton of legal stuff that's very interesting. And I was wondering, like, what about the kids? What was going on with the kids? What were the kids like? What were the kids like before this? What was the marriage like before this? And that's the kind of stuff you're just not going to get from this book because it, it's almost a little too straightforward in a way. Uh, you get a little brief like, oh, they met in college and she was a cheerleader and he was a football player and he, 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 perfect American couple until everything exploded. And that's just not realistic. You finally get basically the book holds hostage for you till about 90% hearing from the kids. You do eventually hear from the kids, not all of them, only the ones who f were comfortable speaking out. And then all of a sudden, thus at that 90%, when you finally hear from the kids, it's like, oh, well, my, the parents fought all the time and it wasn't a perfect marriage and it was a really strained household. And I'm like, I should have had that context a really long time ago. <laughs> so there's a thin line between building suspense between the all American couple and then everything implodes and withholding important contextual information so that I can understand this as a narrative story of people, if that makes sense. And so I found that aspect of it frustrating. I'm still frustrated and feel like I don't have a full picture, particularly from the point of view of the kids. And because the journalist was trusted by the family and the lawyer literally represented the family, I almost feel that they are too close to the story to have properly written it because I can tell that the reason we don't get what we want from it is that they're protecting uh, the kids, which I understand they're kids. And yet I would ex I would still expect a, a good narrative piece of journalist to find a way to give that satisfying context to the reader. So, but that said, if what scratches your itch is messy divorce cases and missing persons and personality disorders and a lot of legal stuff, 
I really enjoyed that aspect of it. I still gave the book like four stars. It was still a good book. It just, it, it had some, it had some faults. Speaking of a book that had some faults, but was still pretty good. Next, I read A Serial Killer's Daughter by Carrie Rawson. I just went right to the sociopaths. She is the daughter of the BTK killer. And this book has actually been on my radar for a few years. And of course, BTK is on our radar if you watched Mindhunter. But I had kind of heard mixed reviews about the book. And so I hadn't picked it up before, but I was like, I'm on a reading kick, I'll do it. So go figure, I ended up with some of the same mixed feelings about the book. So it is technically what it says on the tin, and I did not read the tin closely enough because the subtitle of the book mentions faith. And that is basically my disclaimer here for you. And I actually go into my own conflicted feelings about my conflicted feelings in my Goodreads review. I do recommend giving that a read. I'm not gonna rehash too much of that conversation here. We're basically, it's a memoir about her life and of course, re finding out as an adult that her father was a horrific and notorious serial killer. And it's uh, contrasting the dad that she thought she had with the person that he actually was, but he's two people and her own feelings about it. She had a total breakdown, which I would too, and how she pulled herself out of that and functions today. And People do that in all sorts of different ways. And this is definitely a faith-based narrative. And it started to creep in around the middle. And when I realized what it was and what it was doing, I just was like, oh, that's what this is. So if you like faith-based narratives, it's just gonna land way better with you than it did with me. It, that's just not something that I connect to emotionally. And it got kind of more and more heavy handed as the book went on. It literally has repeated lines of scripture. That's a part of the narrative device of the memoir. And, you know, her church community was really important to her. And thus the second half is more about like her own recovering from her own PTSD and her spiritual journey. That's just important to know because if you're going in just for the tea, the tea is there of like, what was Dennis Rader like as a dad? Your dad was a serial killer. Did you notice? You get all of that very interesting information, but you're also getting it interspersed with a lot of personal navel gazing because that felt authentic to her and it's her book and she gets to write whatever she wants, but it does at points nonetheless feel like you're taking a sidebar into her meeting her husband and how much she loves him. And it's gonna vary how interesting you find that moving to Detroit and like struggling with work, all the church stuff. It's just really gonna vary for you like how much value you get out of that. I'll say that for me, it dragged the pacing a few times, particularly in the middle, because you get two things back to back. So you get this prolonged story. I'm talking, it was four or five chapters of, the, she went on this camping trip to the Grand Canyon with her dad and her brother and a cousin. And it was really awful and they almost died. It's kind of the gist of it, like dehydration, etc. And I'll tell you, it was gripping. I was like, if you like survivalist stuff, it actually reminded me of, of like John Krakauer in that section of the book. And it was really interesting, but totally like smacked me in the face because I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't expecting such a large swath of the book to be about a horrific camping trip in the Grand Canyon that is more about her finding faith in God. That is actually the point of the story than it is about her dad. Her dad's there and you get a slight glimpse into him when he loses his cool, but it, it's, it's not, that's not the point of it. And then immediately following that is her story story about uh, going back to college and falling in love with her husband. And so you basically get this prolonged middle section of the book that definitely lose the plot in that sense. It gets back on track, but that's just kind of my warning to you if you go and reading it. It essentially, it is what it is, but it also still feels like it has pacing problems. And the kind of the ethical question I ask in my review that I do find interesting is, how much can we demand that someone write a book the way we want them to write it? How much can we really demand that a personal <laughs> memoir suit our needs perfectly? So it is what it is. It does what it says on the tin, but I should have pay paid attention to the faith thing on the tin because ultimately the faith based aspect of it just does nothing for me. But it is a very interesting glimpse into what it would be like if one day when you're 26, an FBI agent shows up at your apartment and says, 
your dad is BTK. Whew, I mean, just, <laughs> she finds out that he murdered one of their neighbors. It's pretty dark. So, I mean, pretty good. I I might have given it three, five and rounded up to four, it kind of there and thereabouts. If it's interesting to you, read it, but just kind of go in with those, with that disclaimer. Next, another just Kindle Unlimited thing. Uh, the Carrie Rossin book was not Kindle Unlimited, but this one was An Only Child and Her Sister by Casey Maxwell Clare. Another one where it's like, I looked for the best written thing that sounded interesting to me on Kindle Unlimited so I could breeze through a book. And it actually ended up being really, really interesting. Um, per the title, it is the memoir of a woman who grew up with a sister, but she basically talks about how her parents were dysfunctional narcissists who only loved her. She was the golden child and didn't love her sister and the two divergent paths that they took in life. And even herself as the golden child, she still struggled. I mean, she got pregnant and married at 13. She opens the book with that. She's like, I got pregnant and married at 13 and I was the child who turned out okay. Basically, uh, her parents were kind of old Hollywood royalty, but like minor royalty. I had to look them both up, but there were a few things that they had done that were familiar to me. Her mother was a contract player at MGM, so she was in a bunch of their musicals. And her father was a lyricist. Uh, he, he worked a lot with Desi Arnaz, and so he wrote a song for I Love Lucy, and they're like pictures of this girl at a birthday party for Lucy and Desi's daughter. So like that kind of era of Hollywood in the 50s going into the 60s. and. Both of her parents, as I mentioned, were narcissists, but very different kinds of narcissists with different neglect styles. And it is very fascinating kind of reading about this, this period. Essentially, these are boomer kids who had a very specific type of free range parenting <laughs> thrust upon them. And indeed, she went one way, her sister went another. And it, it, it she talks about her own feelings about this, her own guilt about things while also acknowledging like her parents. And she had a very interesting lifelong relationship with her parents. And she went on to have a successful life and career. And so there's good stuff in there. But yeah, I genuinely enjoyed it. I think I gave it five stars. It was just kind of an interesting read, the kind of memoir you pick up where you don't know the person, they're not specifically famous, but they tell a really interesting story. So if you are interested in kind of old Hollywood, what it was like to grow up in the 50s in a dysfunctional home in Hollywood uh, and, and and kind of a very specific kind of narcissistic parent, not the most, dis I mean, they're, they were pretty destructive, but like almost like just myopically selfish and neglectful type. It was definitely really interesting. And last but not least, I kind of took a hard left, again, inspired by what I was watching. I randomly watched the Madonna directed movie W.E. on Netflix after avoiding it for a decade because I heard it was really bad and it was really bad. But I've always been fascinated by Wallace Warfield Simpson and Edward VIII. I was very fascinated by them as a kid. I was into the royals as a kid in general, um, but I'd never read a biography. And so I was like, I want to read more about Wallace Warfield Simpson. What an odd figure. So I went browsing on Amazon and I picked out the one that I thought would be interesting to me. It was a slight mixed bag. I read That Woman by Anne Seba. Well written. She's a successful professional uh, biographer. And I did like the even handed depiction of Wallace. It is a biography. She starts when, with when she was born and goes all the way up to her death and talks about kind of her impacts on society and her relationships, etc. But she's pretty fair as much as she points out good things and about how she was much and unfairly maligned in popular culture, especially in Britain. She also points out a lot of her faults. She had a lot of faults. She was a messy person. Um, and but also exposes really interesting dynamics to both her marriage to her second husband. So that was Ernest Simpson, as well as the king, the former king, Edward VIII, um, that I thought were just very emotionally complex and interesting and kind of make you think about how things aren't just black and white. It wasn't just this, she met a, a king, a would-be king and fell in love and wanted to marry him and they were punished. It really wasn't that simple. Um, specifically that she really loved her second husband and she just wanted to be married to him and also have uh, Edward VIII on the side. And she was completely fine with that. And so was her husband. But the, uh, Edward VIII kind of forced their hand. It's really, really, really fascinating. So it's just a good solid read. But my one thing I didn't like about it, and it definitely makes me feel unsure about the whole thing, even though I enjoyed it. She makes this weird assertion, the author, 
In the beginning of the book, this theory she puts forth that I felt was completely out of left field and totally unsupported and made me very, very uncomfortable. She speculates in the beginning of the book that she might have had a disorder of sexual development, which is the now preferred term for intersex. So she's basically saying that Wallace was probably intersex slash had a disorder of sexual development, but there's very little supporting evidence that it totally felt weird that she was saying this in the book. Her, her support were things like, oh, well, their regular doctor didn't deliver her, so it wouldn't have been noted, and that's why it's not on the record. And she was very, very thin, and that's a thing. She had a square jaw, ooh, masculine. She wasn't very pretty, and I'm, I'm over here like, I think she was pretty. I don't think having a square jaw and being thin means you had a disorder of sexual development. It's very out of left field and she's making weird suppositions about her sex life. It was very uncomfortable and I'm like, this shouldn't have been in the book. It was just really, really weird. She's trying to under to explain why maybe Wallace was a little bit different. And I'm just like, this is irresponsible. So that's the one thing. I technically have not rated it on Goodreads yet, where I'm like, might have to give you a three for that, because that just feels deeply irresponsible. Unless I missed something, but I read that passage, stopped, googled it to see if anyone else was talking about it. There's no, I just don't think there's any support for it. So anyway, that was my foray into lots of nonfiction. I honestly still haven't quite scratched the itch. I'm probably gonna keep reading nonfiction, but I do, I'm starting to miss fiction. That's a good sign. So the next wrap up you get from me will be your kind of regularly scheduled programming. But this was a, this is a six to eight week period in which I just read a lot of dark memoirs and nonfiction. But uh, yeah, I really enjoy these kinds of books. They're very interesting. Heck, if you have wrecks, drop them down below. Bonus points if they're on Kindle Unlimited. The interesting thing about Kindle Unlimited, and you notice when I note that something is, is self-published, that's not a bad thing. Just for the self-published works, especially in nonfiction, you just have to be very, very careful with the book because sometimes they don't have great covers. You actually have to look and see how they're written to see if it's going to be an enjoyable reading experience. And sometimes they're really, really good. And sometimes they're a little disappointing. It's just kind of a mixed bag, as in the case of the one that I read where just if it had been traditionally published, it would have had a better editor and it probably would have been a better narrative experience. So just, just a note on that. I find Kindle Unlimited very interesting because it's mostly self-published books. So Give this video a thumbs up if you like it. I mean, I'm gonna make reading wrap ups either way. And if you're not already subscribed to the channel, go ahead and do that. I post new videos two to three times a week. As always guys, thank you so much for watching and happy reading.